Hello and welcome aboard. Welcome to Southampton. We are at Southampton International because I don't know. I just felt like it. We are aboard our Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. A little flap going on here. The, uh, what is that? The Chastapugia? Chastapugia? Okay. Whatever. Whatever her name is. Alright, yes, yeah, so we have lots of flap. Good. What does Max Flap look like? Looks like that is Max Flap right there. That's not bad. We don't need it. Just want to look at it, but we don't need it. Interior wise, it's not uh, not the most amazing cockpit. In fact, I'm thinking it's missing a few important gauges, like altitude and airspeed, to name two that I can think of right off the bat. Uh, kind of a problem. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, there we go. Also, incidentally, uh, welcome to what's going to be a series of slightly longer spotlights because there's a lot more information on this next series of aircraft. I think there's a couple that are short, but... All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take off. We're gonna run up our Pratt Whitney R2859 twin roll radial engine, 2,535 horsepower. Oh, and she pulls a little bit to the left there, that's fine. Big old bird, big old tub, the jug. Tail up. Just keep the tail in that kind of attitude, and we should be in the air shortly. We're not. Here we go. Crank in those big old wheels. Nice. All right. Republic P-47 Thunderbolt was one of the largest and heaviest fighter aircraft in history to be powered by a single piston engine. Wow, she does not turn nearly as fast as you would uh, expect. i run her back a little bit. There we go. When fully loaded, the P-47 weighed up to eight tons, and in fighter bomber ground attack rolls could carry five inch rockets or a significant bomb load of 2,500 pounds, which is over half the payload of a B-17 on long range missions. The P-47 is based around that powerful Pratt Whitney the R-2800 double wasp engine. It was to be very effective at short to medium range escort fighter roles in the high altitude air to air combat. And when it was finally unleashed as a fighter bomber, it proved especially adept, adept at ground attack in both World War II Europe and Pacific theaters. Ooh, yeah. Now this was derived off of the XP-47B aircraft, which is the experimental version. All metal construction except for fabric covered tail control services has elliptical wings, which you can see very nicely right there. It's got the cut tips, which does signify a particular model there. With a straight leading edge that was slightly swept back, the cockpit was roomy, very roomy. Pilot seat was comfortable. Some pilots called it a lounge chair. And pilots had every convenience, including cabin air conditioning. How about that? The canopy door originally was hinged upward. That was eventually gotten rid of in, in favor of the sliding canopy. Main and auxiliary self-sealing fuel tanks were placed under the cockpit giving a total capacity of 305 U.S. gallons, which is 1,155 liters. The engine exhaust gases were routed through a pair of wastegate-equipped pipes that ran along each side of the cockpit to drive the turbo supercharger turbine at the bottom of the fuselage, about halfway between the cockpit and the tail, so it'd be sort of back there. At full power, the pipes, you can see them sticking out right there. That's kind of why I'm on the underside here. At full power, the pipes glowed red at the forward end and the turbine was spinning at approximately 21,300 RPM. 
Now this complicated turbo supercharger system with its ductwork gave this aircraft its deep fuselage. It doesn't have that, that thin fuselage that you would see on many other fighters. And it's all because of all that pipe work going on. The wings had to be mounted relatively high position. Now this became problematic since long landing gear were needed to provide the ground clearance. I'm actually gonna slow the aircraft so we can get our landing gear back out, eventually. There they go. So the landing gear actually had to be relatively long. To reduce, oops, let's put those back in and let's engine up a little bit. Uh, this became problematic because uh, that long landing gear needed to provide ground clearance for that big prop, but when you mount your wings up high, of course your landing gear has to be even longer. Uh, to reduce the size and weight of a long landing gear and so that those wing mounted machine guns could be fitted and you would think, well, uh, what does it matter? The, the guns are fitted outboard of the of the wheels. They are fitted outboard of the wheels, but you gotta have a spot for all of the various bits and bobs, like, I don't know, ammo. So to provide for all that, the main landing gear struts were fitted with a mechanism which let it telescope out nine inches, which is 23 centimeters, when it was extended. The refinements eventually led to the P-47D. This is the most produced version, and this is actually what we're flying right now is a D model. There's 12,602 D models built. It's actually a series of evolving production blocks. Some of these changes included the addition of more engine cooling flaps around the back of the cowling. You can actually see them if you look right there on the underside. This reduced the engine overheating problems that have been seen in the field. Engine and engine subsystems were refined as, did the, as were the fuel, oil, and hydraulic systems. They added more armor for the pilot. Uh, the original narrow core Curtis propeller was replaced by propellers with larger blades. The big propellers having barely six inches of ground clearance. It's 152 millimeters. Thunderbolt pilots had to learn to be careful on takeoff to keep the tail down until they obtained adequate glare, ground clearance and on landing to flare their aircraft appropriately. A modification to the main gear was installed to extend landing gears via an electric motor to accommodate this larger propeller diameter. Always larger props, gotta extend your, your uh, gear even more. I go down and like ground attack. Woo. Whee. All right, cool. Uh, now, although the P-51 replaced the P-47 long range escort rolls, Thunderbolt ended the war with 3,752 air to air kills in over 746,000 sorties of all types at the cost of 3,499 P-47s lost to all causes. That includes crashes. So that they were able to kill more aircraft than they lost. In Europe, during the critical first three months of 1944, when the German aircraft industry in Berlin were heavily attacked, the P-47 shot down more German fighters than the P-51. 570 out of 873 total shot down and shot down approximately 900 of the 1,983 claimed during the first six months of 1944. It flew more sorties than the P-51, P-38, and P-40 combined. It is believed to have been truly the aircraft that broke the back of the Luftwaffe. Now on the way back from escorts, pilots would often shoot up ground targets of opportunity. Let's get in the cockpit really quick. They take the time to shoot up ground targets of opportunity. And they used the belly shackles to release bombs on long range Michelin missions. Hackity, 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 hack. Ah, we killed them. Woo. <laughs> we almost crashed, too. This led to the realization that the P 47 could perform a dual function on escort missions as a fighter bomber. Even with its complicated turbo supercharger, its sturdy airframe and tough radial engine could absorb a lot of damage to still return home. 
Some pilots readily chose to belly land their burning Thunderbolts rather than risk bailing out. There are instances of P-47s crash landing after being shot down, hitting trees, and observing impacts severe enough to snap off wings, tail, and engine while the pilot escaped with few or no injuries. This aircraft gradually became the United States Army Air Corps' best fighter bomber, normally carrying 500-pound bombs out on those shackles. Uh, M8 4.5-inch or 5-inch high-velocity aircraft rockets as well, which would be mounted, I believe those were mounted outboard. From D-Day until V-E Day, Thunderbolt pilots claim to have destroyed 86,000 railroad cars, 9,000 locomotives, 6,000 armored fighting vehicles, and 68,000 trucks. If you were the Germans, you hated to see these guys coming because they were going to chew you up. B-47 pilots learned to use a skip bombing technique for difficult targets. This included skipping bombs into railroad tunnels. You thought you were hiding, but oops. Late in the war, the P-47 was also retrofitted with more powerful 5-inch HVAR rockets, which did even more damage. Maximum speed was a 433 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. That's 697 kilometers an hour at 9,145 meters. Combat range, 800 miles. That's uh, 1,290 kilometers, I think. Armament, well, eight 50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns, each gun having 3,400 rounds. To carry 2,500 pounds of bombs and 10 5-inch more rockets. She was a monster when it came to ground attack. Additionally, if you were an enemy pilot, would you really want to be shot by eight 50 caliber guns at once? It's like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to bail out. Screw this. All right, let's get inside really quick. It is a very quiet plane, uh, which is unlike the real aircraft. I, I do know this. I've seen these aircraft. I've been around these aircraft. It is not this quiet. I actually cranked the volume quite a bit for this video. Shift one centers my view. Two, modern ra radio stack. Three, GPS. Four, there's my throttle mixture. Five, oh, look at that. Supercharger and gear warning. Six, oh, look, it's the that thing. Oh, great. Seven is the end. Okay, so that's supposed to be a compass panel. No, it's not. It's your aiming panel. Ugh. All right, well, there we go. I've completely lost the plot of where the, the runway went to. I think I saw some lights over here. Maybe. I don't know where I'm at, even. Uh, hello? hello? Oh, that's a runway, I think. If not, we're just going to land the plane. Hello, Derek. You could. Uh, yes, E-G-H-N is over here. Oh, wait. E G. HJ is up here. Okay, let's go for that. All right, I think the mod looks really nice, except for the severe lack of gazers interiorly. I mean, look, I don't know how fast I'm going. I know what direction I'm going, but I don't know how fast I'm going or how high I am. That's kind of a problem. It is a pretty looking aircraft on the outside. No doubt about that. And it looks proper. Um, I can go pull my pictures from the Dayton Air Museum or any one of the other number of museums I've gone to that has had this. It looks about right. Um, so, yeah. Not a bad not a bad model at all. I would say it really needs a better interior. Because uh, that minimally... You, you could say that they had, like, minimal amount of gauges. But at minimal, they're going to have your airspeed and your altitude. I mean, come on. Do I have air brakes at all? Oh, air brakes puts on fuel tanks. Very nice, I guess. Do I have gears out yet? Okay, there's the flaps. There they are. 
I, I literally was climbing to try to slow this aircraft down. This is not going to end well. <laughs> uh, at least if we screw up, we'll end up in the ocean, right? Right. All right, let's line this guy up. So we got, we got fuel tanks on board now. So that when we crash and burn, it'll be an even bigger fire. <laughs> Ooh, oh boy. I'm basically using flaps to slow down at this point. All right. I have no idea where I am, but we're gonna land here. All right, come on. Here we go. Oh, we're gonna land early. That's all right. It's a big rugged aircraft. Nice big hop in the air. Be nice if I could keep the aircraft down. Brakes. Oh yeah. Maybe. Maybe we'll stop. Maybe not. Oh yeah. Just barely, I think. Oh. Okay, so we went a little bit off. <laughs> Shut her down. Let's open up the cockpit. Nice. All right. So that is the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. The namesake for the A-10 today. Uh, the link is down below, as always. I've been Derek Tebbers. This has been your Flight Simulator x -Plane Spotlight. The Republic P-47 Thunderbolt cockpit is sort of anemic, but the plane itself feels pretty darn good. Until next time. Happy flying, everybody.